The Unshackled Waves, episode 162. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now if you've been following The Unshackled for a while, you would know how the UK has become a police state with hate speech laws, people sent to jail for social media posts, and has now culminated with the jailing of anti-Islam and British values advocate Tommy Robinson. He was summarily sentenced to 13 months in prison for breaching a suspended sentence for filming outside a Muslim gang grooming trial in Leeds. There's been mass international outrage over Tommy's imprisonment, given that he was only attempting to cover what the authorities have been trying to cover up there for a number of years as these Muslim grooming games have operated throughout a number of UK cities. Information about Tommy's imprisonment was originally suppressed in the UK but later lifted. A petition calling on British Prime Minister Theresa May to free Tommy Robinson has now gained over 620,000 signatures at the time of this podcast. We have been covering the free Tommy rallies occurring around Australia. However, they have not nearly as been as big in number or as passionate as those happening in the UK itself. British citizens have been out on the streets, even right up to the gates of Westminster in London with uh, local police uh, finding the strength of the crowd hard to handle. Thankfully, the UK still has a strong alt media community who have been covering the Free Tommy rallies and reporting on all the other concerning trends in the nation. One of them is Daryl Goodliffe, who runs the political blog Kipper Central and is also a writer for Politica Light. We haven't heard a first-hand account of what life is like in the new Ungreat Britain, so I thought that Daryl, given his work, would be the perfect person to have a chat with. Daryl, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim. Now, obviously, the big issue that's really set off the uh, firestorm in the UK is the imprisonment of uh, Tommy Robinson. But I want to go back to what led to this uh, situation, and it's basically the, the culmination of uh, multicultural Britain, which has led to uh, all of these uh, problems. Now, obviously, Britain had mass immigration uh, after the, the Second World War from uh, various places from the, the, the Caribbean and then later on from uh, Asia and the subcontinent and the the, the Middle East. Uh, there was a warning by the, the famous politician Enoch Powell with his uh, Rivers of Blood speech in uh, 1968, uh, where he warned uh, what, what was what was going to be the consequences of this uh, uh, mass immigration, and he's basically been uh, proven right. I mean, what is like, how much has Britain changed over uh, the past 50 years? I mean, I think Britain has changed an awful lot over the last 50 years, and there are certain places in Britain you can go and literally. If you're British, if you know, if you're British, then you're a complete minority. I mean, one that springs to mind is Luton, to be honest, where you've got a specific sort of like Islamic immigration. And I went there for, um, you know, just a shop. And I was like, it was, it was, I was, you know, I felt like I pretty much was the only British person there, to be honest with you. You are surrounded by burqas. I mean, in addition to what you said, obviously, being in the EU with its open borders policy has opened the floodgates to a large degree. And, you know, it was an issue, a specific issue, I think, around Islamic immigration, where there was a complete lack of integration into British culture, into Brit the British way of life, into British values. And talking about rivers of blood, rivers of blood are exactly what we saw in Westminster with a terrorist attack, in Manchester with a despicable bombing of a pop concert, and literally rivers of blood there and you know Enoch has been proved completely right in that sense and it is a specific issue around the Islamic immigration as well it's something Donald Trump's talked about um when it, when he got elected and there was a lack of integration a lack of willingness to integrate as well but as you rightly say it does come from multiculturalism if you celebrate celebrating difference is completely different to say it's okay to be different it's saying it's a good thing to be different you should be different and that has completely destroyed the cohesion of entire communities in Britain, completely destroyed it. And you look at a, a city like London, which is, you know, very, you know, swimming with immigration and it is now completely lawless in London. I have never known anything like it. I've, I've been in politics 20 years 
I've never known anything like what's happening in the Saudi card in London. R- r- sheer barbarism of uh, r- brutal murders every day. But I mean, the involvement of gangs and the complete lack of control over this that Mr. Card has and the government always playing catch up. All, you know, the police are under resourced and hamstrung by completely political correct edicts. Police have to go on courses about Islam, about different PC courses, about different kinds of awareness, rather than spending their time dealing with what's a very serious situation in the capital city. And it's not dissimilar to other cities where the same sort of lawlessness is taking hold. And it's destroyed Britain, destroyed it. And it's been very difficult for ordinary people to to speak up and get a government to listen about these uh, problems that multiculturalism has brought because you're automatically labelled racist. The authorities are, are scared of being uh, uh, called racist. There, there is a, a culture of, of silence where people know that there's a problem. But And of course, you don't have free speech in the, the UK. There's all these uh, vilification laws. So it's, it's a different difficult uh, conundrum that you're in. Boy, it is. And I think, you know, you started talking off about talking about Tommy. And I think that's where the movements come from. You know, from people who are completely silenced and marginalised and unheard by the political class. Uh, completely ignored. And when they do speak up, like they did in the Brexit referendum, and said, we want to take control of our country back. We've had enough of the EU. They're demonised. They're branded by the mainstream media, which is completely in on this, as thick, as useless, completely trodden down. And this is where the movement around Tommy, around where the DFLA, and people who are completely marginalised by an uncaring and crass political establishment. We don't have free speech in this country at all. It's an illusion. Delusion that is becoming even more apparently false. And I think, again, this has given rise to the movement around Tommy. A lot, a lot of people are waking up because of what happened to Tommy, who is a political prisoner. Let's be no, completely clear about this. Tommy Robinson is a political prisoner. There are examples, uh, worse examples, of where a trial has been prejudiced. For example, the Daily Mail, one of our national newspapers, published the identity of suspects in the Stephen Lawrence murder. No action taken, none at all. That journal this is roaming free but of course because he's tommy's tommy and he speaks up especially about islam especially about these grooming gangs which are widespread uh, you know he has to be silenced he has to be put in prison yeah i it's i there's been a lot of legal eagles uh yeah, from both the left and the right of say, oh, Tommy could have uh, pre- uh, prejudiced the, the the trial. But if if you're if we're if we're because we're in the internet age where anyone can uh, put out information about what's going on in the courts, we might as well just have a blackout on whenever a, a, a trial's going on. I mean, isn't it the the media is allowed to report what's going on in court? And just because you know, Tommy doesn't have his uh, press pass uh, there and you know pl- uh, plays nicely, uh, does that justify t- taking him off the streets? Well, there's a few key things to remember. There were other media, there were other cameras there. Uh, my blog, Kiffa Central, the one I'm editor-in-chief of, I don't own, sorry, so it's not my blog, but published um, Ezra Levant, uh, footage of other media you know, outlets being there. There was a group called the Seek Awareness Society in the public gallery, who were, there, who were asked to leave uh, eventually, but the notion that Tommy was doing something especially awful is complete nonsense. And this is why it is right to say he's a political prisoner, because the law is not being applied fairly and evenly in an unbiased way. Tommy also read out names which had been on the local media, the BBC. Yes, so it's being applied in a completely biased way. Yeah, And that's why Tommy is a political prisoner, because he is being treated differently to everybody else. And Tommy, he made the effort to to go around, all around England because these uh, uh, Muslim uh, grooming gangs that they, they, they've been in in multiple uh, cities. Can you just get, uh, give a bit of background on just how prevalent they were? Well, there's been several areas where these scandals have come to light, but it's only been after a very very long period of time. Telford, for example, Rotherham, Rochdale. And quite often it has to be said that, you know, it was complete negligence on the part of the authorities, both the, both the local governing authorities, the local council and the police, 
again, too scared because of political correctness in many instances to do anything because they didn't want to be seen as racist. Yeah, they didn't want to be seen as racist, so they didn't do anything. And it, again, it's a cultural tyranny that we have here in the UK, you know, which is you know, making victims of so many young innocent girls and it's just it's just a complete scandal so tommy was being a journalist yeah tommy was doing the job but me and you do yeah he's doing it well he was doing it right he was seeking the truth and the state put him in prison for it and that's you know again he's a political prisoner of the uk state there's no getting around that there's no legal way around that i think because if the law was the law was applied fairly and evenly and consistently you might say well technically you know here or there but it's not yeah, it's, probably, it's, it's Tommy is, you know, targeted and he's a journalist. Yeah, and uh, one thing you have to note is that Lauren Southern and Brittany Pettibone, who were both excluded from the UK recently, are journalists. There was a specific targeting of journalists at the moment going on. Journalists who are just looking for the truth, who, you know, trying to uncover a great scandal in our national life. And this is a great scandal in our national life, uh, are being targeted by the state. Meanwhile, you'll go into any major city in the UK and you will see buses which say Allah is love and pro-Islamic propaganda is at its height in the UK, especially around these. I have all the national newspapers on notification, basically, and all the Ramadan times were published and all the Eid celebrations and, you know, how great Eid is. And it's really, really concerning, actually, because, you know, it's really concerning to where it's going. Well, wow, that is basically uh, pro uh, propaganda. I mean, uh, uh, like I said, this is uh, the, the the first time I've uh, spoken to to somebody on the on the ground in the the UK, and that that sort of mass propaganda, trying to basically brainwash the people, except Islam, that there would be mass outrage at that here here in Australia. We don't, uh, you know, like to be told uh, that, but yeah, it it is actually as bad as we all think. It basically is, I'm afraid. Yes, I mean, uh, I, you know, I mean, I know there were three uh, Tommy protests in Australia, weren't there? So, I mean, this has gone global as well. Yes. That's an important thing to remember. Uh, and that's, you know, because it's a it's a global awakening. A lot of people are now waking up to what is going on, and you know, thinking about it and saying, no, we don't want that. Do you know what I mean? And this is what's really happened with the uh, Tommy movement. He said in his letter that the establishment fought names. You know, close the book on this, but they've actually just you know written a new chapter because the public have turned the page. I, I, I myself have to be Christian, and you know, Christmas saying God is love, Jesus is love, doesn't happen. Doesn't happen at all. Yeah. Well, okay, that's fine. You might say that's fair enough. Maybe because they shouldn't have religious propaganda on them, and maybe they shouldn't. But the point is, why is Islam allowed to be so different? You know, why is you know, why are police being sent on Islam awareness courses? which they are in the UK, basically, being sent on courses about Islam so it can be sensitive to it, yeah? It's given special treatment. We're not demanding it. We're not saying, you know, impose Christianity on anybody, or I'm certainly not. And, you know, this movement certainly not. What it's saying is this is unequal. It's actually calling for equality, basically, bizarrely enough, given what the left says, because we are not treated equally. And uh, t Tommy Robinson, he's basically become the, the main campaigner against the the Islamization uh, of Britain and for uh, traditional uh, British values. Now, there uh, a lot of the, the criticism directed at, at Tommy is based on his character because he, he likes to confront people. The, the EDL, uh, English Defence League, was a, was a street movement where there were uh, quite a number of, of violent scuffles. And of course, uh, uh, Tommy does have a, a criminal history. He's gone to prison twice for assault and uh, mortgage fraud. Um, what, uh, where, do you, uh, can you give us more sort of context uh, f for that? And uh, do you think that uh, that sort of um, background diminishes Tommy in any way? I don't think it diminishes him at all because I'll say, I'll say this. We were talking about this just before we came on air, weren't we? About how the working class, the ordinary people in Britain, were demonised because of the Brexit vote. They were called thick and racist and all these things, yeah? And again, something similar has happened to Tommy. Now, Tommy left the EDL, yeah? But people have to remember that. Tommy left the EDL because he didn't want it to be... You know, Tommy is not a racist. I, I, I 
guarantee that Tommy is not a racist. Just criticising Islam does not make you a racist, and Tommy is not a racist. That's why he left the EDL, because it was becoming something that he didn't want to be a part of anymore. He, he, he founded it, he built it up, and it was taking a direction which he didn't like. Now, in terms of um, his previous convictions, the mortgage fraud, I believe, is very tenuous, very, very tenuous conviction. In terms of your assaults, you have to look at what Tommy gets from the left, from, you know, state as well. You know, he gets harassed. You know, only recently an immigrant came up to him. He was doing a report somewhere, tapped his camera, camera woman, you know, tried to deck her. Yeah, no, there's such a thing as self-defence, I have to say. And I don't think any of this harms Tommy at all because he is seen, rightly so, as an ordinary working-class lad who's just had enough. He wants to get on with his life, but he just doesn't want this. He doesn't want the Islamification. He's right, that, he's right in that. But I don't think it damages him at all. And I think it's just the establishment doing what they do best, demonising working-class people and making them feel like basically you know, should, should be seen and not heard and just be happy you know with its plasma tv and whatever else yeah and it's holiday in the sun once a year no you know this is working class people ordinary people of this country rising up and saying no and that's what's different about it i think this is not you know this is not a movement of a privilege it's a movement of people who have been excluded and unheard and tommy you know has been persecuted he could have an easy life, he's got a family, he could just have a nice apple pie life, but he chose to speak out and stay to persecute him for it. Now, uh, Tommy's imprisonment, it's, re it's really uh, got all of uh, these issues that have been brewing. It's really, uh, uh, well, the public have now spilled onto the, the streets of the UK uh, demanding uh, his release, which it was difficult for information to get out about his imprisonment in the first place because it was uh, suppressed. So how did the, the, the word spread and how did people uh, galvanise and, and make sure that they, they were heard? I think a lot of it is down to social media and what's called new media. I mean, obviously, the mainstream media barely mentioned his arrest and imprisonment. There was a court order initially restricting reporting on what happened in his court case, uh, which was very quickly lifted. But I mean, oh, the mainstream media is very compliant. Whenever it reports on Tommy, whenever it reports on this movement, it is demonising to demonise it to call it, you know, racist and far right and the mainstream media cannot be trusted at all. I mean, I think we've seen in the US Donald Trump sort of like rose to power on the basis of people like Infowars, a cultural war, basically, a cultural war against the media elite, which, you know, are completely corporately controlled and in the pockets of the establishment and the globalist establishment, it has to be said. And it's been a lot through social media, a lot through Facebook, a lot through Twitter to a lesser degree. But, you know, this, this, this social, it's a social media movement in many ways. And blogs like Hippo Central, like politicalized, you know, de defying the establishment and saying, we are going to report, we are going to tell the truth. Yeah. You know, no matter what the cost. And I think that's the mood of the country at the moment. But certainly the mood of, you know, ordinary working class people, but enough is enough. And, you know, we're not going to have it anymore. What's been the mainstream media reaction and the, the politicians' reaction to these uh, to, uh, to Free Tommy demonstrations? Has there been any change in their editorial line or have they tried to still pretend it's business as usual? There's been no change in their editorial line at all. When they talk about it, they only talk about it to demonise it. So, you know, it's far right, far right thugs do this and do that. You know, it's every time there's a demonstration for Tommy, the words far right, far right, far, far right demonstrators called for Tommy Robinson's release. It's every time it's in a paper, it's, you know, national in that sense, that's mainstream media, it, it, you know, complete demonise. And in terms of the politicians, uh, very, I would say very little said by establishment politicians, to be honest with you. Very little said by establishment politicians. I think they hope it will go away, uh, but it's not going to go away. It's not going to go away at all. I mean, I have to say UKIP have raised it very well. Lord Pearson of Raddock, who's one 
couple of our peers has written to the Home Secretary and said that if anything happens to Tommy in jail, you're going to be sued, basically. And, you know, Gerard Batten, who's our leader, has, you know, spoken very eloquently at the marches and he's, you know, really fought the corner for Tommy and for free speech in this one. So, you know, we're, you know, speaking with my UKIP hat on, this is not going to go away. We're not going to let it go away. Uh, do you think something has changed in the in the mind of the the lay British person? I mean, do you, do you think that uh, this uh, movement for for British values and against Islamization, do you think it has stepped up a notch, or is there still a long way to go to uh, basically maintain the rage? I mean, I think I think it's a bit of both, to be honest with you. But I think what it's done is red pilled a lot of people. I think a lot of people were comfortable in the knowledge. You know, we had free speech and there, you know, sugar and spice and democracy and all things nice in this country. And it's woken a lot of people up to the fact that that is not the case. And it's not the case at all. And a lot of people have had their illusions shattered. And you know, I'm not, I'm not saying. You know, I think it will grow. I think it will grow. And I think. Brexit will play a part as well, especially if Parliament does go through today with launching a coup against, you know, the wishes of the people. It will wake up more people. A lot of people are waking up. That's the main effect it's had. Yes, I think a lot of, you know, a lot of the lay British people are waking up to the fact now that we don't live in a free country. That we're controlled, you know, we're controlled by the corporate and globalist elite, you know, in the EU and, you know, at home. And I think it has, you know, a lot of people are now thinking whoa you know i thought you know everything was okay i thought you know i lived in a nice country with free speech and you know you know and suddenly i don't and that's what bit tommy being put in prison has shown a lot of people i think because a lot of people can see that he's a political prisoner and they, they see through it now we've got you know the mainstream media is not as dominant anymore newspaper circulation is dwindling and, you know, a lot more people are coming on live venues and are sceptical of things like the BBC. And I think that is, that is helping. It's a cultural war. It's a cultural war as well. And that's that's going forward as well. And of course, so, the, yes, I think... and the petition to free uh, Tommy, it's it's gained over 620,000 uh, si signatures now. Now, obviously, uh, from what we've just discussed, the, the the government isn't going to pay attention to that, but it's it's an important symbolic thing that it's got the, this many signatures, the people to, to actually put their name to it. I think it shows the strength of feeling, and you're absolutely right. The government will ignore it. it, it the government ignores petitions which are on its own petition website. There was a debate yesterday on the House of Lords. Over 100,000 people called for a referendum on the abolition of the House of Lords. So people rocked up to the debate. Some MPs said, yeah, that's a good idea. But the government issued a response saying it's still not going to happen. We're not going to do it. So the government ignores, you know, the government, if you rewind right back to the Iraq war, which was a different shade of government, I'll give you that, but still the same people in control, just wearing different hats, isn't it? Of course. But two million people protested against that. Completely ignored. Completely ignored them. So, I mean, but I think there's going to get a wake-up call. I think there's going to be a wake-up call coming soon. Uh, you know, our leader, Gerard, just turned up to demonstrations, and he's quite right to say that, yes, we need to march. Yes, we need to protest. Yes, we need to grow a movement. But at the ballot box, it's where you put your X as, as well. Brexit was won at the ballot box. It was an X in a box from 17 million people. And we, you know, we, we can't forget that. We can't forget the importance of making this pressure felt at the ballot box. Because it's where, it's where it hits the politicians, where it hurts. It's what scares them, losing their job. They're self-interested, self-serving clique. But if you if you put that, you know, if enough people put that X in a box for a party which is willing to stand up for free speech, which is standing up for the likes of Tommy, they'll have to take notice because they'll lose their jobs if they don't.
Now, one of the other grassroots organisations that's emerged to uh, f uh, fight the, the Islamization of Britain is the Football uh, Lads Alliance. Now, Association Football, it's uh, arguably England's uh, greatest export. The, the Premier League is probably the, the, the best league in the, the world. And uh, traditionally, uh, English football fans uh, of uh, different clubs, there, there's been <laughs> quite, quite, quite a bit of uh, animosity and, uh, and aggression uh, between them the each club had their different uh, firms but they've all uh, come to come together now to basically save what is uh, well not not just well bec like I said uh, football is is the national sport it represents uh, Britain uh, so, so can you t tell us more about that well yeah I mean I, th I think it is people who have realized they have more in common with each other than they do with the people who oppose us, the people who are pursuing policies which destroy in our communities and lay waste to them, completely lay waste to them. And, you know, it, it, it's been a great thing to see the different clubs coming together because, as you're right, um, the local, you know, local teams, very strong rivalries. Locally, where I am, it's Cambridge, you know, we, we all sing our songs about hating the Cambridge scum and whatever else, like, you know, football fans do. But at the end of the day, on these demonstrations, we, we realise we've got more in common with each other than we have with them. And that, you know, is what, what makes it a challenging prospect for the establishment because, you know, football fans are not people to be slapped down. Not, uh, not at all, or, you know, controlled <laughs> in the way that they want them to. Yeah, that... that so, that, I mean, it's quite... That's certainly right. I mean, that's great. It's a great, it's a great, it's a great thing that's happening to politics in this country. You know, it was sort of like the Football Lads Alliance. You're right, the Democratic Football Lads Alliance, but they're coming together on the 23rd for you know marching for Brexit and for free speech. So that's a great, that's a very historic thing as well. You know, it was a bit of a split in the movement there, which has now been healed. Because, you know, Tommy's arrest has made people realise, you know, what's at stake and, you know, what can happen, you know, if, we, if we're divided, we're going to be picked off, you know, in that sense. But, you know, united we stand and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing for Britain. It's a great thing for Britain as a country and for British politics. Now, we've talked a bit about the, the political class in, in the UK and uh, the, the Conservative Party, well, they're not really uh, conservatives, well, uh, by Australian standards, they're certainly not, but there's still uh, a few uh, politicians in it who give some glimmer of hope. There's Jacob Rees, uh, Mogg, and there's also uh, Dan Hannan. Of, what do you think is the, the state of the Conservative Party? I think the Conservative Party is a party that are at war with itself. I think this Europe thing has been a perennial thing for the Conservative Party. Um, you know, John Major, remember John Major? John Major, who really took us into the EU, um, you know, in many ways. And that was when Nigel Farage, obviously, who led UKIP, left over the Maastricht Treaty. The Conservative Party is a party at war with itself because there is a group of the party you know, a big chunk of the party, actually, I think, which is, you know, in league with this globalist establishment, this globalist agenda of being in the EU and, you know, you know, globalisation is good, borders are bad and, you know, British identity should be, you know, a many splintered thing. But there is a more traditional, obviously, aspect to the Conservative Party, as you say, that, you know, says no, you know, which is very you know, strongly attached to the nation state and to British values. And, you know, it's got a very split identity, the Conservative Party, and it shows through in splits between, like, Dominic Grieve, who leads the Tory Ramoning rebels, and, you know, Jacob Rees-Mogg, like you rightly said, who is very patriotic, you know, you know, very strong on family values and things like that as well. And it does show through, but it is a party at war with itself. And a house that is uh, divided cannot stand. We'll find out today what happens, obviously, with the Brexit vote, and we'll see how that goes. But, um, you know, it, I mean, the Labour Party split as well, obviously. But, I mean, it, you know, the Conservative Party is at war with itself, and it has been for a long time, actually. Now, Labour, the UK Labour Party has gone a bit of a transformation under the, the leadership of Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, for a number of years, the uh, Labour followed the, the globalist EU line, but Corbyn's quite different. Yes, he's a far-left uh, socialist, but uh, he's also anti-globalist. 
Well, yes, he is, but he's very much a prisoner of his party. And the gentleman called Keir Starmer, who's the Labour shadow Brexit folks, who takes regular trips to Brussels, yeah, let's be under no illusions about what he does. He's a, you know, he's a poodle. He's a lapdog for Brussels, Keir Starmer is. But the, the majority of the parliamentary Labour Party is um, basically Remain and is globalist. And I have to say, Corbyn's quite caved. The Labour Party is now in favour of a stated a version of the customs union is it you know a version of the single market because i reckon corbyn probably did vote for brexit he's never really said but i reckon he did because as you say he's old school he's old school benite socialist which is anti-globalist which sees the corporate eu as very you know hostile and antithetical to democracy which they're right it is in 1983 it was the labor party that proposed a referendum on the EU, not the Conservative Party, but he's very much a prisoner, Jeremy Corbyn, of the you know Remain backed Labour establishment, and especially the Parliamentary Labour Party, but also the Labour Party outside, even left wing organisations like Momentum, which you would say you know are you know a socialist to the core. Actually, a lot of pro Europeans in them, you know, who buy into this globalist agenda. So the left has really collapsed. There was a time in the early 90s when, you know, the left was going on anti-capitalist protests to Genoa, and, you know, doing all that and protesting outside the G8, you know, against globalism. But now it's just completely folded into this, you know, globalist Soros-backed agenda, as we've seen in the US, actually, with the Democrats as well. Complete capitulation on the part of the left. And Corbyn's done the same. Uh, you know, he's, you know, he, I... I did look at him and I did agree with him on everything. Obviously, I'm, you know, a UKIP member, but I used to think he, you know, he was genuine. But now he just allowed himself to become a prisoner of his own party. So Labour Party is pro-Remain, and you know, a lot of people in the Labour Party saying they want a second referendum to overrule the first one because they didn't get the right answer the first time. Now, you've mentioned that you're a member of uh, UKIP, and uh, it's fair to say since Nigel Farage uh, stepped down, he felt that his work was complete with the triumph of Brexit. There's been quite the power vacuum in UKIP. There's been a number of leadership uh, changes. What is the, the state of UKIP? Can it still be the, the force it once was? I think UKIP is very much being bored again. Um, in, the, in the last week, we've had... Paul Joseph Watson, who I'm sure many of you know, your listeners will know, mm, yeah. does InfoWars, join us. We've had somebody called Count Dankula join us, who's a very popular YouTuber over here. He was fine for doing a video of his girlfriend's pug doing a Nazi salute. Uh, and Sargon joined us. So we've had three really prominent free speech campaigners join us in the last week, you know, which is a massive boost for us, because you're right, we have had real difficulties, but Gerard has filled that gap very well. He's now our permanent leader. You know, he, he's going to step down and allow an election next year, but he's our permanent leader now. He's very critical of Islam, very critical. He calls fundamentalists literalists, which I believe is correct, that they are, li the fun fundamentalists are literally interpreting the Quran. There is a problem in the book. It's not with, you know, it's not with this loony fringe. It's with people who read that book literally because that is literally what that book says uh, and you know Gerard is putting us on a very sound footing it's taking time you know everything takes time we are effectively re re rebuilding a party basically and you're right Brexit was the thing that gave UKIP its purpose its focus that big boost this week of you know Paul media him coming out and saying right I'm joining UKIP now and fighting free speech with UKIP and that's, you know, a massive boost to us. So I think we're back. We're back. We, you know, we did have a long time away. And, you know, we're moving on. We're moving on because Nigel, Nigel has done some fantastic things for this country. He really has. You know, nobody can take that away from him. But, uh, you know, Nigel's been very critical of Tommy. And I think he's wrong about that. And we're moving into a post-Nigel future now. We're becoming a new party in many ways. The UK authorities, they've got all these counter-terrorism units and all these uh, uh, anti-radicalisation uh, pro or de-radicalisation uh, programs, which keeps them very busy and they still can't prevent uh, terror attacks. But amazingly, they've still got time for a so-called far-right uh, crackdown. Now, this was 
triggered by the the Finsbury Mosque uh, revenge terror attack, where Theresa May uh, said that Islamophobia was a form of extremism, and then the the Home Secretary Amber Rudd uh, introduced that if you were if you were viewing so-called far right material online, you could uh, go uh, go to jail and. Uh, your your blog could could be classified uh, as that. What it's, do, does do these sort of uh, laws and rhetoric uh, scare you? No. Well, I, I I believe in the power of the truth, and I I have some questions for the UK government about this far right crackdown. For example, they often talk about a group called National Action. Now, I've been on a lot of demonstrations, a lot of activities. I have physically never heard of National Action. Yeah, I haven't got a clue who they are. I really don't. I've never met anybody claiming to be from National Action, trying to recruit, audition out propaganda. And, you know, uh, say a free Tommy March, you would expect a group like that to be there to try and capitalise, wouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, it's logical, yeah? But I've physically never heard of National Action. They, they, they only seem to exist in government press releases. They really do. Because I've physically never heard of them. And, you know, I would like to know from the UK government who these people actually are because I'm going to do some research on it and I'm planning to do an article on it on social media so I physically don't know who they are whether, and they don't appear to exist apart from in the heads of this government so who are they what you know who are these people you know where are they come from because we don't know them and you know we're involved in movements and doing things you'd think we'd come across them wouldn't you you would think that would be logical but we don't so I am very suspicious of what's going on with this so-called far-right crackdown because it's something doesn't add up to me as a journalist. It doesn't add up to me. It's like, you know, show us national action then. Who are they? You know, and that's, you know, I, like I said, very suspicious. You can never prove these things, can you? And that's, it. you know, you can never. But I think questions need to be asked of the government about this, about who these people are. You know, they're claiming to, you know, uh, you know sinister far-right terrorists, yeah? I don't think they, you know, I don't think they exist. I mean, I intend to do some further research on it and look into it, but I think we need to ask that question. But all the so far, so-called far-right crackdown is coming on, you know, decent, hard-working journalists. Tommy Robinson is a journalist. I think, you know, because he's so involved in politics, we forget what he actually is. Yeah, I mean, he's actually a journalist. He's actually a journalist doing his job. Yeah, investigating something try to uncover the truth yeah which you know i you know i understand it as a journalist is our job to uncover the truth but uh, you know state crackdowns don't scare me because i mean they don't scare a lot of us because we stand on the truth and as long as we stand on the truth then that you know we let, let, let us be judged in the course of public opinion yeah let us let that happen and i think you know increasingly as i said the public are seeing through it they don't buy it anymore and there's also been uh, attempts to uh, link uh, Tommy and uh, other activists and journalists such as y yourself with the, the old school na the nationalist groups like the, the, the British National Party and the, the National Front, which have been around for, for decades, but uh, they're, they're considered too extreme. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there is, right, legit, criticism of Islam is completely legitimate. Yeah? And there is nothing, for a for start, Islam isn't a race. Yeah, mm, it's a religion, yeah. yeah? Just like my religion, my faith is, a, you know, a faith, yeah. I could be black, white, brown, whatever, and be a Christian, yeah. Be black, white, brown, or whatever, and be a Muslim, yeah. It is not a race. We need to remember that, yeah. So, but, you know, but those groups, those groups, you know, there are racists around, you know, but this is not this movement. This is not Tommy. We are not the racists, yeah. If anything, the people who positively discriminate in favour of a faith, yeah, like I said, where are the buses at Christmas saying, and they're in every major city in Ramadan they were, saying, love Allah, love Allah, Allah is love, yeah. Where are the buses at Christmas with the billboard saying, Jesus is love? Yeah, I'm not saying you know I'm not saying necessarily there should be, but you know the point is is they are the ones that discriminate. They the establishment are the ones that discriminate. You know, but I have never physically had a conversation. I've been on a fair few you know free Tommy events now. I've been in Manchester, London. I have physically never had a conversation with somebody who I would regard as a racist. Yeah, 
So I, it's all propaganda, all propaganda to say you don't deserve to be heard. You know, you you know, you know, you're wrong. You're 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 bad, bad people who shouldn't be, you know, allowed to have a point of view. But it's all complete rubbish. It's all complete rubbish. I have, like I said, I've been on a few, and I've never had a conversation with somebody I would regard as racist. I've had a conversation with people who have a problem with Islam, but I mean that's not racism. Uh, now, we've talked about how the, the UK uh, doesn't have uh, free speech, and probably the, the most uh, extreme uh, example of that is uh, internet trolls uh, have actually gone to jail, uh, lost their jobs for, for saying things that, that are obviously mean and uh, would be considered in, in bad taste, but filling the, the, the jails with them seems uh, quite ridiculous. And what are probably one of the, the worst laws that you have against uh, free speech is Section 5 of the the public order act yeah i think i think what you've said what you've seen and i think this is happening across you know certainly in the european continent and in the us and the uk is law, the whole fundamental basis of law is being changed from what is objective I, if somebody bakes into my house yeah that's an objective fact they forced the lid, window or smashed it to actually you know, that's an objective fact, objectively provable. But what's becoming more important now is hurt feelings, yeah? Subjective feelings. The basis, the very foundations of the law is becoming subjective. It's how people feel about things. Not what actually happened, but how people... And that is a very, very dangerous place for us to be, I think. Yeah, because I could take offence at something you said and say, hate speech, hate, hate speech. Yeah, but you could have done nothing wrong and you, you might have criticised me on perfectly legitimate grounds, yeah, you know, but I can still get you locked away under this baneful piece of legislation which makes, you know, cri crimes exist in people's heads now. That's not how law should be, because that's very, like I said, I think it's a very dangerous place for the law to be. That's where dictatorship starts to come in. But yeah, because people's feelings are obviously completely different to what's objectively provable. So, I mean, there's a whole gamut of hate speech legislation, and you talked about the internet. Um, today, the EU is voting on some of the most draconian controls on the internet you could possibly imagine. Basically, one of the articles means that if you're a blog, you know, Kipper Central is a blog, and, you know, we reproduce other people's content, we quote from other people's content, you will have to have uh, the, the license holder's permission probably cost money so that's going to basically outlaw reproducing other people's content even if you link to it even if you credit it and say this came from a daily express for example which you know we always do in our articles we credit you no know, resource but you know that's going to be illegal now you would have to ask their permission <laughs> and basically memes are going to be illegal because they're setting up a new algorithm oh, no. and what they want social media yeah the drug Embedded algorithms. They want social media outlets like Facebook to install mm. this al algorithm which detects hate speech. Hate uh. speech, yeah. Which, you know, you know, and this is the most draconian piece of legislation you could imagine. And, you know, the EU's voted on it today. I expect the EU to vote for it because the EU is a giant, undemocratic monster. So, uh, you know, I don't expect it to be stopped by the EU. You know, our MEP will be voted against it, I'm sure. But sadly, you know, nowhere near a majority. The majority of sheep in Brussels will go through, you know, with, with the bureaucrats and vote it through. But, you know, this is happening and it's happening under the radar to a large degree. You know, this this is another reason why we need Brexit, because the EU is losing control. It's losing control. You've seen in Italy, populist revolts, the you know, the populist government with a movement five star and the Liga, who I believe have taken the lead for the first time in the polls, you know, really advancing. You've got Eastern Europe where governments are standing up for their people and saying, No, we're not having this uncontrolled massive move. Even in Germany, the heartland, the heartland of the Euro Federalist beast. Angela Merkel's coalition partners are saying we can't have this uncontrolled immigration anymore because the uh, alternative for Germany, the AFD, are really, really pushing hard. So, you know, there is a kickback. The people of Europe are, are fighting back, you know, and, you know, a lot of that was started by Brexit. A lot of it, you know, was Brexit was a spark that lit the flames. It showed that they can, they can have a different f uh, future free of this monster, you know, this, you know, abomination of an organization that they can have a free future and it is 
court has kind of, you know, not been good for, it's only really been good for the Eurocrats. You know, you know, people in Greece, in Italy, in Spain are unemployed and poor. You know, in Germany as well, it's taking hold, you know, it is a rotten beast. But, you know, the people of Europe are turning around and saying enough is enough. But this is why the EU is obviously doing this, because they're losing control. They're losing their grip uh, of people's minds and, you know, they're losing the culture war. So obviously now they have to tighten the noose to, to, to survive. It was uh, a great moment when when the UK people voted for uh, Brexit, uh, f- fifty two to to forty eight percent, and uh, it it was the beginning of uh, what I call the the twenty sixteen uh, mass triggering, where the the elites, the the globalists, had a mass uh, freak out and caused uh, David Cameron to resign as Prime Minister. Theresa May, even though she uh, was a Remainer, she vowed that Brexit means Brexit, but it's been uh, two years uh, later now, and uh, still uh, negotiations both with the, the EU and uh, through through the Parliament uh, are still uh, not complete. There, there was an important vote in the the, the House of Lords who uh, put in uh, an amendment to the uh, Brexit legislation. Can you go, can you give us an overview of where uh, the UK is at with Brexit? Well, actually, yeah, there's a crew, that, that amendment basically said the peers had previously amended the Brexit bill 15 times to try and keep us in. The, the, no, the peers have been a complete wrecking ball for Brexit, but what they voted for on Monday was basically giving Parliament a veto on the Brexit deal, saying it should have a meaningful vote on the Brexit deal. Now, the thing about this is, obviously, is that Parliament had a vote on the EU Referendum Act. It gave a decision to the people. The people gave their decision and they gave their instructions to the representatives and they said, we want to leave. As you rightly say, it was a great day, Independence Day, we call it, uh, you know. But now we've got a, a situation where Parliament is trying to launch a coup, basically, against the will of the people and say, no, we're in charge. We'll have this meaningful vote. Now, what happens today? It's on a knife edge. But, I mean, basically also, you know, Article 50 will be triggered on March 29th next year. So, in theory, that's the day we exit the European Union. But we've already been told there's going to be at least another year where we'll still be in the European Union. And it gets worse. We won't have any MEPs anymore because they, they'll be chucked out after the European elections. Yeah. So we will be reduced to a vassal state for, for at least a year. And Theresa May may look like a Brexiteer today because she's facing down a remoting parliament. But she's actually not a Brexiteer in her heart. She still won't say which way she'd vote if it was a referendum tomorrow. And we, all, I think we all know that she'd still vote for Remain. She's still a Remainer. She's just a, a Brexiteer by convenience, as it were. And, you know, this is, this is, this is where Brexit is. It's, still, it's an ongoing battle. It's not won yet. Not won at all. You know, that, but what happened on June 23rd, 2016 was just the beginning. And we're still, we're still fighting that war. And that's why it was a big demonstration in London on June the 23rd, you know, to mark its two year anniversary on Saturday. So important, so, so important that everybody gets out for that. And, you know, I'm sure they will. I'm sure it's going to be a big demo, you know, to keep the pressure up and keep holding the government's feet to the fire, as it were. But I mean, we talked about UKIP and, you know, you know UKIP has really got to get on its feet to fight as well, because hitting them at the ballot box is where it hurts, it hurts them the most. Do you think that the the benefits of uh, Brexit that the people voted for can uh, obviously you, you've you've talked about the the difficulties in in getting Brexit through, but can can they eventually uh, be realised? And you can you uh, elaborate on some of them? Well, yeah, I mean, I think I think you know economic benefits of Brexit are already starting to shine through. It was Project Fear before Brexit say, oh no, the world will cave in, you know, it'll be mass unemployment, you know, it'll be the end of, end of civilization as we know it. But it hasn't happened. The UK economy has stayed resilient. You know, we've got the Commonwealth, Commonwealth, and you know, you know, President Trump has said, you know, Britain will get a trade deal. You know, it was a whole exciting world of opportunities. The other important thing is that we get control of our lawmaking process and our borders. Now, we talked a bit, you know, at the beginning about the issue about Islamification. It is linked a lot with the EU because obviously the EU demands open borders. Uh, but, you know, getting so getting control of our own borders back will be a big plus. 
Uh, whether it will happen or not, that depends a lot on you. Know, that's a very fluid situation, I think. I, I would worry. I worry that we'll get Bre- what's called Brino, Brexit in, no- in name only. So we'll get the appearance of Brexit. You know, and you know, all the pomp and ceremony will happen on March 29th next year. But actually, they'll still be in control. And, you know, that is something that we've all got to be aware of, I think, because there is a danger there, I think, you know, a very big danger, I think, that, um, you know, we will get Brexit, but in name only, not what we call a a clean Brexit and make a proper break, especially with a government which is half-hearted in its convictions, an opposition which is Remain, let's be completely honest now, it's a Remain opposition, uh, and, you know, we're going over this launching a war of attrition. We've seen this before with the EU, with the Lisbon Treaty, where countries have voted to no, and they've banged and banged and banged, and then the second time they voted, they got their way. And that's got to be the concern uh, for Brexit. But I think people, are, if you look at the polls, the support for Brexit is actually even rising now. So I think people are seeing the opportunities that exist outside the EU, for Britain to be free. So there is hope, hope and caution, I would say. Yeah, uh, I think that's a good note to end on. Hope that uh, Brexit will be realised and also hope that uh, uh, this uh, campaign to, to free Tommy, even if he is you know, still uh, re- remains in prison, that the authorities, the, the politicians, you know, don't forget who, who, who he is and uh, what he's done and, and uh, how the people uh, view him. So uh, I, I definitely main, maintain the rage in Brexit and, and free Tommy and obviously uh, make sure that you don't get carted off in the, the middle of the night by the, the far right uh, crackdown. S- stay safe. Oh, I will do. And you too. Thank you for having me, Tim. It's been a pleasure. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. A reminder, tickets are on sale for Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern's tour in Australia this July. They'll be visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane, as well as Auckland. The tour is being hosted by new events company Axomatic Events, and you can book your place by visiting axomatic.events. Former UKIP leader Nigel Farage is also coming to Australia this September. He'll be visiting Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth and Brisbane and Auckland as well. It is being brought to you by the same people who brought you Milo Live last year. Tickets, including various VIP passes, can be booked at nigellive.com.au. The True Blue Crew as annual Aussie Pride flag march is this weekend. It was one of the first events we covered out in the field in Melbourne last year, and we'll be back again there this year. It is this Sunday, the 24th of June at 12 p.m. and begins at the Royal Exhibition Building. This type of event probably matters more now than ever, given the persecution of nationalists we are seeing throughout the Western world. So please come along. Don't be deterred by the intimidation of the campaign against racism and fascism, who always protest these type of events. Also, don't forget, if you want to take The Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards in the process, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. Don't forget, we have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.